here enjoying your lunch, and I am sure you will enjoy this talk more than your lunch. Um, what housekeeping do? Well, so I'm Gerald Cohen. I'm the chief economist of the Keenan Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome my friend, former colleague, uh, Professor Kara Watson, a professor at Williams College and the director of the Brookings Center for Economic Security and Opportunity, CISO. That's a queso, queso, sorry. Very messed it up. Um, uh, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I, so I want to thank Bruce and Katie Van Son, who are hosting Tara as one of our distinguished fellows, for which is a, we have scholars from uh, well-regarded scholars from around, you know, at, at UNC or at Keenan Flagler and around the country on topics of interest related, or topics related to our grand challenge. Kara's actually joining us um, related to our 2023 grand challenge of workforce disrupted, although her topic of Im on immigration is well, is, is also quite re related to our topic of business resilience this year. Um, Tara is uh, an author in addition to, so she's going to talk about immigration, and I would encourage you to read her book, um, The Border Within, The Economics of Immigration in the Age of Fear. I'm going to leave this, leave you to, leave Tara, to, I'm going to make this quick, it's by one, two housekeeping issues, so we're here for an hour. Um, you are welcome to ask questions in the midst of Kara's talk, but I would encourage you to try to wait until the end because she has about 40 minutes of material and has left 20 minutes to, um, to talk, or 20 minutes to Q and a, for Q&A. The second housekeeping matter is if you have a bag of chips, I would encourage you, strongly encourage you, to open it now. <laughs> so that we can hear Tara during your talk. There we go. You're doing better than my students. <laughs> Tara, the floor is yours, and thank you. Thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here. Can everyone hear me OK? Good. Um, I came here to UNC for the first time in the fall. I gave a very similar talk to this at a conference, um, and I'm glad to be here talking about immigration again. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, it's an issue that never stops being um, in the news, and so uh, plenty to talk about. And I am happy to take questions as we go, and I'll also leave some time at the end. Uh, so what I'm gonna try to fit in today for a very large and expansive topic is an overview of immigration, um, very, very high level, obviously, given the time. I'll talk what we know about the economic impacts of immigration, some fiscal impacts, meaning the effects on government budgets, um, some demographic implications, and then um, some, a little bit about the social impacts of immigrants in our society. Um, and then I'll close out by talking some about the current policy landscape and how I think um, we could be doing a lot better. So just as a starting point, about 14% of our population in the US was born outside the US. Um, so these are decadal um, numbers here, so going from 1900, um, when we ha also had around 14% of our population uh, foreign born, and going to 2010, and then these are a recent set of five years, 2018 to 2022, um, there's a little bit of a lag in knowing how many immigrants we have in the U.S. now um, because the census is a little bit backlogged in putting out those numbers. Um, so the 2022 number, the estimate is 46.2 million. People think there was quite a lot of immigration in the past year or two, and so that number is likely to increase um, substantially when we get the new estimate, maybe around 49 million. Um, just to highlight that there's been some change lately, um, this figure is based on data that comes from a recently released port, report from the Congressional Budget Office. And they put this out as part of their 
forecasts for economic growth and demographic projections. And they break immigrants into three groups. And what the, this figure is trying to estimate is the number of net migrants coming in a given year. And by net migrants, I mean people entering the US minus people leaving the US. So this is a flow into the US. And they break it into these three groups that are relevant for policy. So this blue, um, sort of medium blue line here, that is what they refer to as the lawful permanent residence plus category. Those are people coming to the US, newly arriving in the US with a, uh, because they have a green card. So often this would be people who have a relative living in the US. They may have been waiting for quite some time in a queue to get a green card. They've got their green card and they come to the US. And you can see um, we have a fairly steady um, pattern there and that's coming from the fact that most categories within that green card um, system are capped and so leads to fairly smooth flows. We did see a decline starting in um, 2019, 2020, of course, because of COVID, um, but now it's come back to fairly normal levels. So we have those regular flows of people coming to stay permanently. Um, we have a second group, which the Congressional Budget Office calls INA non-immigrants. Um, those are people who are here on a visa, but it's a temporary visa. So that would be a student visa, that could be a temporary employment visa. And um, the flows into this category um, are sort of noisy from year to year, um, but again have been fairly steady over time. And the reason that this is pretty close to zero is that people often are leaving and coming in on this category. So the net flows tend to be close to zero. But as you can see, um, what's really changed in the past couple of years has been this other non-immigrant category. So um, there's quite a bit of debate about this group and what's happening with them, but the CBO estimate is that um, that group is more than two million people for 2023. And what that uh, group includes are people who have arrived at the border they may have encountered um, someone at the border, an official, and been allowed to go into the US while they wait for a court trial to see if they might be eligible for asylum. It would also include people who cross the border without ever encountering anyone uh, who would be entering an undocumented population, um, and some other categories of parole that um, the Biden administration has set up. So really what has shifted here is this other non-immigrant category has really expanded in the past couple of years. Um, just to give a little um, more context here, um, that temporary employment and student visa category that I mentioned, um, the people coming in were about 1.7 million, but as I mentioned, there are always people flowing out of those groups as well. Um, for the undocumented migration, so this would include um, people who have never encountered an official at the border but have crossed the border without papers or people who came in on a temporary visa and overstayed. Um, that group combined, we think there's something like 11 or 12 million people in that group in the US. Um, before the pandemic, that was estimated around 11 million, but we really don't know what's been happening lately. Um, the CBO report estimates that maybe over a million people entered that category in 2023. And then there's this asylum seeking parole group um, that is in sort of a nebulous legal status where uh, the US government knows who they are and they are waiting for a process to happen. Um, and that is um, over 2 million people came in that way in 2023. So that's where a lot of the policy discussion has been in the very recent uh, years. Um, but now I'm gonna turn to talking about the economic impacts, and most of this literature is based on a long history of migration that we've had in the US and is not specific to this current moment, um, but I think has implications for it. So there has been a very robust economics literature looking at the effects of immigrants on the economy, and often the first question that people ask is, do immigrants take jobs from Americans or depress American wages? Um, and um, the bulk of the economics literature says, no, that is not what happens. 
uh, when immigrants come to the US, um, you, it might be natural if you just think of a very simple supply and de demand diagram to think that that would push down wages for the US born population. Um, but there are a few reasons that people have um, shown happen um, when immigrants come. So one is that there is more specialization. Um, so people specialize according to their skills and that allows firms to be more productive and eventually hire more workers, uh, both immigrant and non-immigrant workers. Um, there's also an effect on aggregate demand, um, which might be part of what we're seeing right now in the economy where immigrants, of course, purchase goods and services, just like the US born, and so that spurs on economic um, activity. And then a third um, thing that has been shown to happen is that when immigrants come to the US, a firm that might have otherwise relocated to a cheaper country for production instead decides to stay in the US and um, therefore you know, maintains the job base in the US and or changes their um, adoption of technology. So they might be slower to adopt a technology that is labor replacing um, because there is a, an abundant source of labor available. So all of these things combined um, lead to the impact that if you look, and people have done this a variety of different ways, if you look on average, um, the average US born worker actually may have improvements in their employment outcomes when immigrants arrive. Um, however, there is some more debate about what happens for um, the group that's most likely to compete with immigrants for work. Um, and so um, there is, of course, concern about rising inequality in general, and the, con the concern would be that at the bottom of the income distribution, um, immigrants are um, depressing wages there. And the, the evidence there, I would say, is a little more mixed. So as we think about immigration, we need to be careful to make sure that um, immigration doesn't cause displacement of US-born workers with less education. Um, when people have tried to really study this, the main group they find are affected are earlier waves of immigrants um, because they are most directly competing with the workers um, that are coming in. So I'll just pause there if anyone has questions. Yes. Yes, yes, so the foreign born includes, regardless of your current status, anyone born outside. Um, all right, so uh, thinking more about what happens when immigrants come in terms of the labor market, there are some things that people might not necessarily think about in a simple supply-demand framework, but uh, research has shown that immigrants tend to um, move around the country, around the US, um, more than US-born workers. And what that means is that they can kind of respond very quickly to local economic shocks. So uh, one economist, George Borjas, has called this greasing the wheels of the labor market, meaning that immigrants um, kind of help um, even out economic activity across the, the US by going to places where there are job, short, job shortages or uh, labor shortages and um, leaving places more quickly um, when there are downturns. So for example, in the Great Recession, um, immigrants tended to leave more quickly than the US born from places that were really hard hit by the recession um, and therefore dampened the impacts on the US born workers. Um, of course, when there are labor shortages, uh, immigration could be one way to fill those. And um, there are some industries that are where I think there are really critical needs for immigrants in particular. Um, so one example that people often cite is the agricultural industry. This industry is very disproportionately um, supported by immigrant labor and would be unlikely to survive without immigrant labor. Um, so if you could imagine if we suddenly had no immigrants in the US, um, a lot of the agriculture would have to move outside the US in order to um, exist, it just isn't, wouldn't be profitable without that labor supply. Um, another area that I've been focusing on in my own work is the role of direct care workers, so 
people like home health aides or nurses aides. Um, immigrants are disproportionately represented there. And as we have an aging population, that is going to be an even more critical need going forward. Um, big picture, it's actually pretty easy to make the case that um, immigrants are good for economic growth and business. Um, so immigrants are more likely to own businesses than the US born. Um, and when you look at what's been happening to small business, almost all the growth, or actually by some estimates, more than all the growth in those small businesses is coming from immigrant owned businesses. Um, also for big businesses. So um, almost half of Fortune 500 CEOs are either immigrants themselves or the child of immigrants. Um, there's a disproportionate representation in STEM fields, in innovation, so as measured by patents, um, disproportionate representation in Nobel Prize winners. Um, and it's also the case that um, we can see this employment effect um, just as uh, this is one example. So the H-1B is a visa that allows uh, largely tech workers to come to the U.S. on a temporary basis. And that is an oversubscribed program, so there's a lottery. And when firms win that lottery, meaning they are able to hire an H-1B workers, it's been shown that they actually hire more U.S.-born workers in addition. And so um, there's actually really valuable spillovers that can happen um, through this, Im these immigration inflows on business. Okay, so overall, economic impacts look pretty good. Um, with, a, with a little asterisk by, um, you know, needing to be careful about the bottom of the U.S. born income distribution. Fiscal impacts um, is, a, is a distinct thing. Sometimes these get lumped together. But when, we're, when I talk about fiscal impacts, again, what I'm talking about is, is government revenues and government expenditures. Uh, so there was a National Academies of Science study that did a really careful job of trying to understand all of the different inflows and outflows. Um, and there are a lot of complicated methodological issues that I won't get into. Um, but what they tried to do is say, what is the impact of one additional immigrant on budgets at the federal level and then at the combined state and local level? And um, this took into account their dependents as well, so the, the children of the immigrants. Um, and they did this two different ways. So one is to say in a given year, so they looked at 2012 and they said, what's the effect of an immigrant this year? And then I'll show you in a minute, they did a sort of longer horizon one. So what you find is that, um, so this is revenues, receipts. So immigrants contribute to revenue as you would expect, right? They pay taxes, even undocumented immigrants do pay taxes, um, both at the federal level and the state and local level. However, they also are responsible for some expenditures, both at the federal level and at the state and local level. And if you net those two out, what you get is a positive fiscal impact and a slightly larger negative state and local impact. So um, what that means is a lot of the benefits are accruing to the federal government, and some of the short-term costs, this, this point-in-time costs, are borne by the state and local level. And so if we think about what the, the political implications of that, there would be um, maybe some mismatch between what state and local governments were experiencing and what the, the federal government thought was happening. And a lot of this, as I'll come back to, this federal positive impact is going through the social security system. So immigrants are contributing to that system through payroll taxes um, and not taking as much out of that system. And so um, that sort of, that, that system is benefiting but the cost side is largely coming from education and health spending um, when immigrants first arrive, and, and their descendants too, of course. Um, so then the same report said, well, let's look over a 75-year horizon. So let's look at the whole flow of what we expect for an immigrant coming now um, over the next 75 years, and they discount that to be you know, in current dollars. So think about the sort of equivalent of what you'd have to spend today. And um, again, you see this um, mismatch um, between the federal and the state and local. So I'll just go to the net impact. Um, one immigrant, they estimate, has a positive impact of $312,000 in present discounted value. 
um, including their descendants over a 75-year period, um, and the state and local impact is almost zero. Um, and so again, what we see is the federal government is really benefiting from this. State and local impacts are kind of neutral. Um, and so um, I think it's important to acknowledge that, especially you know, in this moment where we have a lot of immigrants coming with specific needs, the state and local governments are going to be um, the ones providing those safety net supports, um, but the feds are going to be recouping um, the, the revenue. And so um, there arguably should be some transfers happening from the federal government to places that are absorbing more uh, immigrants. And uh, Wendy Edelberg, uh, my colleague at Brookings and I wrote a report last year trying to make the case that this is what should happen. And this map is a bit outdated now, um, but it shows where um, immigrants were going um, as of around 2016-ish. Um, and specifically, this is newly arrived immigrants who came the last five years um, without a BA. And they're the ones where the fiscal impacts are gonna be the greatest. Um, so it's, it's pretty widespread pockets across the US of places that could be um, benefiting from this support. Okay. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about is the role of immigration social security solvency. So as you probably know, uh, we have a social security system that is more or less a pay as you go system, meaning the current workers are funding the current retired population. And um, that uh, has a little bit of a um, savings account, if you will, trust fund built up because um, we saw the baby boom uh, cohort retiring um, and we knew this was coming, so we, we saved some of their money and put it aside um, in this trust fund, but that trust fund is projected to deplete in 2034. Um, so just about in time for me and Gerald to retire. Um, and um, when that happens, the day that happens, we'll only be able to cover 75% of the current benefits um, for the current retirees at that point. And so, um, one possibility is we will just have a much smaller social security system, but there's a lot of political support for social security, and so um, more likely is that there's gonna be some sort of compromise reform that happens, has gotta happen quickly, um, but it will be some combination of raising taxes and cutting benefits, um, but immigration can also play a role. So if we can expand immigration, as I just showed you, that um, those federal revenues go up when there's more immigration, and this could help sustain the system, um, it won't solve the system, so any sort of reasonable um, immigration levels you would imagine would be politically feasible will not um, be enough to fully address the social security crisis, but um, it can help, and it can mean that benefit cuts can be um, smaller and tax increases can be smaller. Uh, this is going to be very important because um, people are getting old in the U.S., so we have an aging population. Um, so 2020, we had about 56 million people uh, over the age of 65. By 2060, that'll be almost 95 million. So that's a lot more people. Um, we don't have a similar change in the working age population. In fact, without immigrant inflows, the working age population will be in decline starting this year. Um, and so um, this is actually a graph of that. Um, so the... Um, the future of our population, working age population, is entirely dependent on immigration um, and, and or there could be changes in fertility, but even if there were changes in fertility today, it would take a little, you know, some time for that to work its way through into the working age population. So immigration is really important for population growth uh, and therefore economic growth. Um, you can see it pretty clearly here. The natural increase um, has been, this is the, the darker bars, that's been declining except for, um, there was a, an extreme drip during the COVID era and now we're sort of back to the trend. Um, but people are having fewer children um, and so we have this slow um, increase in uh, what's considered the natural rate 
um, and immigration is really driving the, the bulk of population growth. You can see it again here using um, population pyramids. So I don't know how familiar you are, but these are five-year age bins separated by gender. And um, what I've done here is show in the darkest shade, uh, first generation immigrants, meaning people born outside the US. The, the next shade is people, the children of people born outside the US. And then the lighter uh, group is the, um, anyone who is at more than two generations. And um, what you can see again is like this working age population is very dominated by um, foreign born um, individuals and their children. And so uh, again, we really need that population in order to be able to uh, sustain our care for the old age population. Um, and just to hammer the point home, this uh, was a piece that came out last week that um, again shows that if we just look at the labor force, it's all coming from immigration inflows, uh, the growth. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, what's happened with some social indicators. So sometimes um, the rhetoric can be pretty negative and it's just not borne out by the data. Um, so I apologize that these aren't the most beautiful um, pictures. These are from a piece um, that came out as a working paper last year where the authors look over, since 1940 in the censuses and tried to document a variety of social indicators um, comparing immigrants, meaning foreign born, the foreign born population, um, to, um, to non-immigrants. And actually, specifically here, they focus on the white US born. They have some other charts where they uh, look at the full population of US born. And um, so this is the incarceration rate, much lower for immigrants. This is the labor force participation rate, much higher for immigrants. Um, this is the marriage rate. Uh, much higher for immigrants. So on a lot of social indicators that people might think are important, uh, immigrants look pretty good. So um, just to take away what I've said so far, um, immigration is really important for labor, for innovation, for economic growth, for demographics. Um, and um, a lot of the um, concern about social impacts is misplaced. Um, so given that, you can tell I'm pretty, uh, pretty enthusiastic about immigrants and their role in our economy. And so what should we do with that? How should we translate that into policy? Um, so I'm going to talk through um, some big picture policy issues, and I hope we can open it up for more of a conversation. Um, so the first thing is we have a legal immigration system. And it sort of has, um, you can think of it as operating on two tracks. So we have a green card system. That's um, a system that allows people to get permanent residency. They can either, um, I'm, I'm sort of uh, waving my hands around a lot of the nuance here, but most of the people getting a green card are either coming through a family connection um, and except for parents and children of, and spouses of, um, US citizens, there are caps on the number of people that can come through a family connection in a given year. And there is also um, an employment pathway um, through those green cards, but people typically are already in the US when they come with the green card, uh, employment green card, um, they've come on a, a temporary uh, visa first. So we've got a sort of green card system, then we have a temporary system, which allows people to come in and work on a temporary basis, um, the the well-known example is the H-1B program. So this is for mainly highly educated workers working in the tech sector, and they are uh, arriving. They're allowed to stay three years and renew another three years, and then they can get in the queue for the, the permanent status. There's also temporary employment-based migration that is meant to be truly temporary. People have to leave after a certain period of time. Um, so these caps on the... Um, on the permanent migration were set most recently in 1990 and haven't been updated since then. Our economy has doubled since then. Population has grown substantially. So we have these caps that are really out of date um, compared to our labor needs. Um, so that's one big policy issue. And I would argue it's um, spilling over into what's happening at the border 
um, because there, it's very hard for people to come through one of these regular green card pathways. Um, second, we don't have the institutional capacity, so um, there just isn't, there aren't enough people um, in the bureaucracy to process the immigration um, system. So right now at the border, we have a lot of people showing up to the border. There are not enough people at the border to process them, so that's one piece. There is a very large backlog in the court systems so that includes people seeking asylum. They have to go through a court process. There are also people who are living in the US without documentation, who are um, maybe in a court process about being removed or deported. Um, so those court systems are completely backlogged. Um, and then just general processing of regular everyday business um, is also really backlogged. The bureaucracy um, was already really struggling and then COVID hit and things just sort of went off the rails. It's come a little bit back, it's a little bit better, but things are still looking pretty bad. So that, those are the policy issues that I think are really critical. Um, and then there's of course a political story here. So um, Congress hasn't taken major action on immigration since 1996. Um, I don't see a lot of political incentive for uh, either Democrats or Republicans to tackle this. Um, if you try to understand, especially for things where you would think there would be a consensus, like expanding Im immigration of highly educated um, tech workers, for example, um, there is just not um, enough of a um, policy overlap in other parts of the immigration space, and no one wants to give up on that, which they think of as a bargaining chip, in order to get the, um, the set of policies that they're interested. So if you... Um, Poll Republicans, they care a lot about uh, immigration in general, and uh, especially border security. Um, and Democrats uh, have it ranked a little bit lower on their priority list in terms of voting, um, but also within the immigration space tend to care about humanitarian concerns more. And there's really not a coalition focused on this um, economic or demographic argument right now. Um, so this is just showing the legal um, immigration caps. Um, these, these are the family-based categories. This is the employment category. These are a few other um, programs, including this is the people who can get a green card through being a refugee or asylum, or being granted asylum. Um, but most of these, um, these two groups, these big groups, um, are capped, and in addition to sort of an overall annual cap, there are limits for a given um, country in that no more than 7% of employment-based uh, green cards and no more than 7% of family-based green cards can come from any one country. So a country like India or China or Mexico is gonna be treated equivalently to a very small country that doesn't send many people. Um, that is part of what's creating these very long uh, long lines and backlogs. Um, just to give you a sense of what the backlogs look like, um, depending on the category that you're in, there are different backlogs. Um, but for example, adult children of citizens um, from Mexico, this um, is from the April bulletin, which means if someone, uh, that says 01 May 01, so if someone applied in May 2001, for a green card from Mexico because they were the adult child of a citizen, they just got their message that now is their time to submit their final paperwork and they can come, okay? So that's a long time to wait. Um, similarly, on the employment side, in the sort of middle category, um, there's some backlogs that aren't quite as severe, but someone um, who was born in India, who applied in 2012, again, with the employment category, they were probably already in the US for six years by then. Um, they are now just getting their notification that they can proceed. Um, so there's just, uh, yeah, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of backlogs in the system. This is the court backlog. Um, you can see that um, there's just a lot, of, um, a lot of demand for services that isn't being met. Um, this is, I know you can't read this and you're not meant to. It's meant to be more of a visual, a visual illustration. This is um, a report that the Cato Institute did uh, they're a libertarian think tank um, that are um, trying
trying to make the point of um, if someone wants to come to the US, uh, what, what might they do and how might they work their way through the system, they end up calculating that only a tiny sh fraction, um, a couple of percent of the people worldwide who would be interested in coming to the US could actually make it through the system. So I mentioned this before, but if you uh, poll, Gallup polled uh, people about whether they think immigration is important, they do in general, um, and especially Republicans do. Um, and um, so what do I take away from all this in terms of reform? I've already explained that I think um, the caps need to be addressed, the legal system needs to be addressed. Um, and the reason I said before that I think it's related to what's happening at the border is for many people, if they don't have either an, a high level of education or a family member in the US, there is virtually no way for them to come to the US other than showing up at the border and making an asylum claim. So there is, um, there's sort of no legal pathway for a lot of people who are very interested in coming here. And I think it's really important to have some pathways that give people hope um, that might discourage them from making a very dangerous trek um, to the border in order to, to take their shot. Um, I also think there are some interesting things we could do. Um, there's an idea of a heartland visa out there, which is um, the idea of an employment-based visa that would be tied to a place, a, a place in decline specifically, um, and uh, would otherwise operate like an H-1B. Um, there's also potentially could be a direct care worker visa to try to shore up our uh, really critical need in that area. Um, I mentioned the bureauc bureaucratic infrastructure. There's also, um, we had even before COVID and this recent um, surge, we had 11 to 12 million people who were undocumented living in the US. They're in a very um, precarious legal situation. Um, and then the people that have come recently, um, more than 2 million, um, are people who are in the US, the government has allowed them to enter in a sense, but they don't have any right to stay permanently. And um, th th that is going to come to a head, um, either when people have their asylum claim denied, which will happen to more than half of them probably, or um, some people have come on this humanitarian parole program that Biden has set up, um, which is a two year chance to come and make the asylum claim. Um, but again, those people will have to, to leave um, if they don't have a status after two years, and it's not really clear how that will work. Um, and then I've also mentioned that there are some pretty severe fiscal burdens happening to some places right now that are absorbing a lot of immigrants who are coming in, in many cases without um, much with them. And so um, federal assistance would make sense, especially given that in the long run, um, the federal government will reap the rewards of having immigrants in the country. So bottom line is um, Congress has really been silent on this issue for a long time. Uh, I view it as an abdication of responsibility. It's their job to be making um, this uh, system work. And what happens when they don't do that is that the executive branch kind of fills the void. And that means we get these wild swings in immigration policy every time there's a new president. Uh, in power, and that is, um, I think, bad for sort of society in general. It's a lot of inconsistency. It's bad for immigrants themselves. They don't know what's coming down the pike. It's bad for uh, the American public to not feel like there's a, um, a clear direction. Um, it really discredits the system overall. So Congress needs to step in and sort of come up with a compromise that can guide us going forward. Um, and uh, one economist called this uh, failure to address this problem is leaving a trillion dollar bills on the sidewalk because immigration is so valuable to our economy and setting up a system that allows more people to come and to come through regular pathways is really the right way to go. I don't see much hope for um, anything happening uh, <laughs> right now. Uh, who knows you know, where we'll be next year um, but right now, it really seems like this is being used as a wedge issue. And um, I was, I've 
sort of been hopeful until recently that maybe the labor market pressure and the demographic pressure would be enough to push people into doing something about this. But now I think that window has probably closed until the election is over. So uh, last thing I'll say is um, I'll just give a shout out to my book. And also for students, I, um, I give students e-copies. Um, so if you want a copy, email me, twatson at brookings.edu, and I will be happy to send you one. And I will stop there and take questions. Yes. I, I am uh, Crystal Reed. I work in the National Designing Program. Um, my question is centered around where your interest in this topic has come from. Like, what is the driving force or your passion behind wanting to pursue this research? Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually got interested in it because I studied the US safety net and I um, was writing a paper about what happened with welfare reform in 1996. Um, if you look at that time, uh, there was a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric and the bill itself has some anti-immigrant language within it. And there was also simultaneously a drop off in the participation of kids in Medicaid, in especially kids from uh, kids of non-citizen parents, um, most of whom are them, the kids themselves are citizens. So kids uh, did not lose Medicaid eligibility, especially the citizens had uh, no reason to lose Medicaid eligibility, but their participation in the program really dropped off when welfare reform was passed. So I was trying to understand what happened there. And I um, discovered that the same, within a month of that welfare reform bill being passed, there was also a really sharp expansion in enforcement um, funding passed. And so it turns out the places where the Medicaid dropped off were the places where the enforcement was um, picking up the most. And so I got interested in this nexus of safety net and enforcement, and then that got me interested in enforcement in general, wrote this book. And then um, I just recently got to Washington about two years ago, and I have always focused on interior enforcement and what's happening to families that are living here. Um, no one in Washington is talking about that. And uh, I, I finally realized like all the oxygen is being uh, discussion of the border. And so uh, I've started to sort of think more holistically about the whole system. Uh, thank you, that was a really interesting talk. Um, so I'm just wondering with this current uptick in immigration, are there any changes in the composition of the immigrant skill level, country of origin? So did that have any impact on the policy response? Yes, so that's a good question. The, um, the, that flow that I showed you at the beginning, that's that um, other non-immigrant flow, tends to be less educated than the average immigrant, um, tends to be coming, fleeing um, you know, instability or violence. Um, the, there's more um, nuance there than you might otherwise think, so actually, like. There are people coming with college degrees who were a dentist in Venezuela or something. So there's a, there is a lot of heterogeneity. Um, but in terms of the big picture, this group of uh, people is going to be, is not going to have the, for the most part, not going to have the advanced technical training that, um, say, an H-1B visa holder would. Um, and so that does make the political conversation harder, I think. Um, the um, there's more consensus around the highly educated immigrants than there is around uh, people with less education. Um, and I think that combined with the fact that people are coming and coming to the border in instead of through a regular pathway also complicates the conversation because um, that's not the ideal s scenario, right? We, it's not ideal for immigrants themselves who would be better off flying to the US rather than coming through a very dangerous um, track, but also not ideal from a sort of policy making perspective. You wouldn't, the, the idea is not to have people showing up at the border and like sort of rolling the dice. Yeah. Thank you so much for the talk. It's very interesting. I would like to know what does an election do to the immigration policy change? I'm very new to this, so yeah. So the executive branch, as I mentioned at the end there, does have a lot of discretion here. 
uh, coming in part because the laws on the books are so outdated that they're sort of almost just ignored. Um, they, um, we sort of had this before, right? So um, I can give you a little history. Um, I won't go back too far, but um, Obama came into office and he thought that maybe after healthcare reform, he would tackle immigration as a big issue. And he, um, in, our, in the sort of ramp up to that, this is me editorializing a bit about his motivation, but he was pretty aggressive on enforcement. Um, a lot of people were deported. And I think he was trying to signal um, that he was serious about it, he wanted to compromise, and they got pretty close. There was a bill that passed um, with a bipartisan group of eight senators that you know, put something forward, it was a good package, and then it never got brought up in the House. Um, and th so then that reform kind of died. And so then I, my perspective, my um, trying to read Obama's mind, is that he kind of gave up and he just decided, I'm just not gonna do enforcement, there's no hope for reform. Uh, and so um, the second term of Obama had very low levels of enforcement. And um, then uh, Trump came into office, and, but even before Trump came into office, um, there were some slowdowns in some sectors. It seemed like maybe there were f other reasons around the world that people weren't wanting to come as much. And um, Trump came in, he had a very aggressive border policy, um, and he had a very aggressive public posture about it. If you actually look at his removals and deportations, they're not as high as they were in Obama's first term. Um, and so it's, it was more sort of about setting a tone than it was about actually removing or deporting people, but they were, it was more than Obama had done the second term. So um, what happened, and part of what I talk about in the book is this idea of chilling effects, that when people don't feel like the system is easily understandable and they feel like I could be deported any day, and there's no sort of method to the madness, then that causes people to, um, to be nervous, to not engage in society as much, to um, they change their workplace behaviors. Um, and then COVID hit, immigration almost stopped. Um, and so we don't quite know what would have happened towards the end of Trump in the absence of that. Um, but I would imagine if Trump wins the election, um, we will see sort of, a, again, a more aggressive posturing, um, perhaps uh, almost certainly an increase in removals compared to what Biden is doing, which is very little. And, um, and I don't know sort of what implications that will have. I do believe that it's possible that a lot of what we're seeing right now at the border is people who recognize that this might be their last sort of chance to come to the US, and so they're trying to take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. Um, I mean, within the broader debate of immigration, is there like nuance between high school immigration versus undocumented immigration versus other forms of immigration? I'm, I'm just curious yeah. because I would think like there's a H-1B cap, but I would, I, would, I would see that kind of like an easy win because I mean, it's high school immigrants less likely to you know, commit crime, more likely to decide what this will happen. Yeah, actually crime rates uh, are very low across the board, but um, separately from that, um, the, um, I agree with you that the H-1B seems like, and the employment-based permanent uh, visa green card would be, would be sort of an area of common ground. Um, and I think that is true. And I've talked to people uh, on both sides of the aisle who all will say that to you. But what happens is, if you talk to someone whose base is mainly on the right, they, um, they feel that if they give in on that issue, they will lose border security as a, as a potential win. So they want to sort of pair um, H-1B or high skill immigration with border security. If you talk to people on the left, they fear that if they give in on the H-1B, they will lose um, the possibility of having legal status for an undocumented population. So they want to pair H-1B with the, the legal status and the humanitarian concerns for that group. So 
basically both of them are sort of holding that issue, issue hostage to try to achieve their broader aims. Um, and so we haven't seen change there. Um, I'm just curious if you've seen in other countries similar issues that the U.S. is having, or if there's been a country that successfully put demographics and economics at the forefront of their immigration reform. Um, good question. So I would say yes and yes. <laughs> there are, um, this is an issue in a lot of countries and a growing issue. Uh, there's like a, a lot of global migration right now, and I anticipate that will further increase as we have more climate-induced migration and um, political instability around the world. So a lot of countries, uh, representatives of countries will come to Brookings and like ask for help. And I'm like, why are you asking us for help? <laughs> we, we, we have not figured this out. However, there are a few uh, countries that are being much more aggressive in recruiting, especially this highly skilled immigration workforce, um, Canada, Australia, um, and I wouldn't say those countries are free from problems, um, but they're definitely countries that are thinking about it from an economic perspective first and trying to be proactive and recognizing that um, there's sort of a, a race for global talent that um, they could win if they step in where the U.S. is lacking. So um, just as one example, Canada, um, I think it was last summer, they, they just said one day, like, um, if you're still waiting for your green card and you're, if you're a programmer, you can apply here and we'll let you into Canada and give you a green card today. And it was, they had like, I don't remember the number, 10 or 30,000 slots that sold out in a day. And, you know, they're, they're going to get, other countries are going to, um, so sometimes I think if I just make this like about a competition, then maybe <laughs> immigrants will be, uh, I, I think it's a, a bad idea for our economy to let that talent pool um, go elsewhere if, you know, from a U.S. first perspective. And so um, I'd like us to be more proactive about that. Do you know if there's a number um, equivalent to net fiscal impact or especially the 7.2 months per day for the workers? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so one thing I learned in the course of reading that report carefully is that the typical U.S. born person has a negative net fiscal impact. Um, because if you think about us as a society, we spend more than we bring in. <laughs> um, and so um, the group that actually has the biggest fiscal benefit is second generation immigrants, because they tend to have higher levels of education than the average US born person. Um, so it sort of goes first generation, second, and, and they do it, it's sort of complicated by the life course because people tend not to contribute a lot when they're kids and when they're old and then they're more productive. So when immigrants come in, they tend to be in their working age years, so that sort of facilitates a positive impact. But in any given age, um, this, the second generation is the, the winner. Yeah. Yes? Um, just where do you see your research on this um, moving forward? Um, because from your conclusion, it sounds like it's much more of a political problem than a policy problem that we're stuck here, right? Like, yeah. We had the bipartisan border security bill and the Republican Party in the Senate was completely unserious about it. Um, so I'm just curious, like, as an economist, is there a way that you can um, incorporate these pretty much purely partisan political incentives into the calculus here because your previous set, right, of um, labor market and demographics don't seem to convince enough people on that side of the aisle? That's a great question. Uh, so I am an economist, I am not a political scientist or a policy lobbyist or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's tough for me to think about. Um, I just almost try to approach it with a faith-like um, belief that if you just keep putting the facts out there, eventually people will come around. But I, because that's my only tool, I don't think I'm going to be able to, me personally, other people can do their advocacy work and maybe do whatever they do. But for my contribution, as given my training, is has to be coming from, this is just um, a pretty clear economic win for us. And just keep making the case. And then when the time is right, hopefully the evidence base will be there for people to move forward. We were chatting earlier about the this is a uh, relatively muted voices in the business community in the face of this big cultural debate. And uh, even though 
they seem to be or would be a clear beneficiary. I'm, I'm hoping that you just talk about that a little more. Yeah. Uh, so I, I agree that um, I would expect big business to be more, um, or not just big businesses, all businesses really, to be more at the forefront of making the case. So many of you as future business leaders perhaps can be the ones to um, take this on. Um, I do think it's just an uncomfortable, um, an uncomfortable position given the other dynamics at play. So given the the left, and especially the far left, um, isn't going to be embracing business, the business case. Um, and on the right, um, there is this sort of other dynamic going on that's uh, rooted in anti-immigrant rhetoric that's not based on economics, I don't think. Um, and so um, it's just hard to, to see where the nexus is. I do, as I mentioned at the very end there, I do think that there is going to be some just realization as we come up to the social security cliff and we come to this need for direct care workers because we have a lot of old people and we have no one to take care of them, there's just gonna be, at some point, you know, ordinary people are gonna be saying, we need more workers and maybe that will do the trick. But right now the politics just don't seem to be there. But I don't have a great explanation, yeah. I have questions, one, and how does the local government and the world team have been impacted by the immigration? There's something that needs to be doing differently to, to uh, change the course of that event, or we just we, we can't like, change that. And second question is about uh, the other economies, like in Europe, uh, currently the UK government banned that, um, students or healthcare workers to bring their dependents because it's negatively, negatively impacting their economy. So right. what's, your, what's your advice or your take on that? Yeah, those are good questions. So. Um, on the first question, which is what can we be doing, I think the local governments are right now feeling a pinch, many of them. And, um, and I do think the federal government should be stepping in. It is, a federal, it is a federal policy area and the feds are making the decisions about how many people to let in. And um, I think the, gov the federal government just needs to step up. I don't know that there's political will for that. Um, but funding transfers for, um, so what we suggested in that, the paper I wrote with Wendy Edelberg were funding transfers to schools that are absorbing a lot of children and uh, funding for community health centers that in places where there are a lot of immigrants uh, who would often be served by those community health centers. Um, so I think you could, you could funnel resources in a way that would make this um, easier for places that are absorbing a lot of immigrants right now. And then remind me of your second question again. Oh, the dependents. Yeah, I think that's um, a bit short-sighted. <laughs> so when, uh, when I think about the direct care workers, uh, you could imagine having a visa that is a temporary visa that doesn't allow people to bring their families and they just come for three years and work in direct care. Um, I, I see two reasons not to go that route. One is that um, in direct care, it's the client-patient relationship is really important, and so uh, sort of switching people out on a frequent basis doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but also, this is a long-term challenge. This is not a three-year shortage, right? We have, we can see that we are going to have many, many millions of people who are going to need support, care, um, and we don't have. We can see that we don't have the workforce, and even if every US born, well, not, if every US born person became a direct care worker, we'd be okay, but um, we could have a very large increase in the US born workforce in this area and still need quite a lot of immigration in order to meet the need. And so um, it's a long-term problem. So I think a permanent long-term visa makes sense. What I, the way I would structure it would be like the H-1B, so people would come for three years, renew, and then be able to get a green card. So, we unfortunately are out of time, um, but first of all, I want us to thank you.